Good morning class. I am English teacher Ruchi Kulkarni. At the onset, I must welcome you to this new session. You are in class 8th now and congratulations on coming to this stage of life. This is our first online class and before we begin with teaching and learning, let me introduce you to the books that we are going to have in this session. We have in totality three books. One is your compactor wherein you will have your grammar and your writing section. Then you have honeydew which is for your uh, reading portion, the literature reader. And we have another book, the third one which is a small literature reader book wherein you will have only stories and poems to read. So students, let's begin with the first chapter of our honeydew and the session of class 8th. In case you do not have these books, I will be telling you uh, the stories or I will be showing you the PDF file of the chapter on the laptop in this video itself so that you can read with me and understand the explanation and the new vocabulary that you are going to imbibe. To begin with, you can come to this page wherein we have the starting of this chapter. But students, before I begin with the chapter, let me ask you a few things. Do you like to receive presents? Yes, of course, I don't think there's anybody in this world who would not like to receive presents, of course, yes. But sometimes the presents may not be as a material gift. It could may not be an object. Sometimes the presents can be emotions like happiness. This chapter that we are going to talk about is at the backdrop of a war between Britain and Germany in 1914. Now this uh, chapter talks about two scenarios. One scenario is the war that's happening between the British and the German soldiers and that's the Christmas Eve. And at the Christmas Eve, both the enemies, instead of fighting, they plan to celebrate Christmas. And while they celebrate Christmas, it was seen that each and every soldier was very happy, was very contented. And in the heart of hearts, they thought that instead of fighting wars, playing games or competing in sports would be the best possible way to, to uh, decide who wins and who loses. That's the first scenario. And because they had this happiness on the Christmas Eve, rather than fighting a war, that happiness was their Christmas present in that part of the story. The second scenario goes to a lady called Connie Macpherson, whose husband Jim Macpherson was a soldier in the same army, which was fighting the war. And Jim, in one of his letters, had described about this particular thing that I just told you, uh, a sport between the two armies and uh, the way they celebrated their Christmas Eve. And in the same letter, he promised Coney that he'll be back on the next Christmas Eve. But as luck would have it, he could not come back. He died in the war. Coney loved her husband a lot. And it was a test of her love. For years, she kept that last letter of Jim very close to her heart. She secured it closely. But one fine day, her house uh, uh, was burnt in a fire and she was shifted to a nursing home. Now this particular desk where she had kept her husband's last letter, that is Jim's last letter, was uh, luckily found by the narrator. The narrator read the letter and he decided to return that letter to Kony. So he, uh, he started searching for her and it was known that Kony was in a particular uh, nursing home. He went to that nursing home and he met Kony where he kept that letter in front of her. Kony was very very old and she was not in a stable state of mind. And at that 
that particular moment when Kony saw that letter, she mistook the narrator as her own husband, Jim. And there was happiness on her face. There was a glow on her face. And this glow, this happiness which Kony experienced was like the best Christmas present in the world for her. So that was the story, children. And now we begin with the reading of the chapter for which I would like you to sit with your books and pencils in your hand and whenever I we, we come across a difficult word or a new vocabulary I will explain you you will underline and write the meaning there so children let's start students this is the PDF of the chapter and let's begin reading chapter first the best Christmas present in the world written by Michael Morpurgo we come to the first part of the chapter. I spotted it in a junk shop in Britport. Underline the word spotted it. I will tell you the meanings later while explaining the paragraph. I spotted it in a junk shop in Britport, a roll top desk. The man said it was early 19th century and oak. Underline the word oak. I had wanted one, but they were far too expensive. This one was in a bad condition. The roll top in several pieces. One leg clumsily mended. Underline the word clumsily. Mended. And scorch marks. Scorch marks all down one side. It was going for very little money. I thought I could restore it. Underline the word restore. It would be a risk, a challenge, but I had to have it. I paid the man and brought it back to my workroom at the back of the garage. I began work on it on Christmas Eve. The story starts with the beginning scene that narrator who had always wished to buy a roll top desk had, has gone to an antique shop to buy one for himself. Now he finds a very, uh, a very old desk which had a roll top desk. Roll top desk, you understand, which can be opened up and down. He found this particular desk which was of uh, for less value also, but this particular desk had scorch marks on it. Scorch marks are the burn marks. This word you have already underlined in your book also, and. Its one leg was clumsily mended. Clumsily means awkwardly and mended means repaired, which means that this desk was burnt and his, its one leg was broken. Now narrator thought that if he took this as a challenge, he bought, he, he thought of buying this particular desk because he thought that it is, since it's of less value, he could get more benefit out of it and he also thought that if he could repair this particular desk then he can use it for himself so he gave the money to the shopkeeper and he bought the desk he put it he kept it in the garage and he started to work on it and or repair on it i removed the roll top completely and pulled out the drawers the veneer underlying the word veneer had lifted almost everywhere it looked like water damage to me. Both fire and water had clearly taken their toll on this desk. Underline this phrase, taken their toll. The last drawer was stuck fast. I tried all I could to ease it out gently. In the end, I used brute force. I struck it sharply with the side of my fist and the drawer flew open to reveal a shallow space underneath a secret drawer. There was something in there. I reached in and took out a small black tin box. Cello taped to the top of it was a piece of lined notepaper and written on it in shaky handwriting, Jim's last letter received January 25th, 1915, to be buried with me when the time comes. I knew 
as I did it, that it was wrong of me to open the box. But curiosity got the better of my scruples. Scruples, underline the word scruples. It usually does. Inside the box, there was an envelope. The address read, Mrs. Jim McPherson, 12 Copper Beaches, Bridport, Dorset. I took out the letter and unfolded it. It was written in pencil and dated at the top, December 26th, 1914. Now, when he started to repair this particular desk, he saw that the entire veneer, veneer means the sunmica, that the layer that is put on the furniture, uh, in other words, it's called sunmica also, that veneer was being pulled off. So he started to work on it, on this, and he pulled off the entire veneer on from top of the desk. And he also observed that a lot of damage was done due to fire and water. And there's this particular phrase, taken their toll. Taken their toll means it was completely damaged because of the fire and the water. It was, it seemed as if a fire must have occurred in that house due to which the desk must have got burnt and to put out that fire, people must have thrown water on it. So both these things had completely damaged the desk. But yes, it was a challenge for the writer uh, to repair it and use it. So he started to repair it. When he started to repair it, there was a particular, he started to dismantle it. He started to break it off in parts. And he found that there was a particular drawer which was stuck fast. Stuck fast means which was tightly went, uh, inside the desk. He tried to open it, but it could not be opened. So he used a lot of pressure, a power, some power, and he pulled it out of the desk. Inside the drawer, he found a box. And on that box, it was written, Jim's last letter received January 25th, 1915 to be buried with me when the time comes. When letter, when narrator saw this letter, he was in a dilemma. There were two thoughts going in his mind. One was the curiosity to open that letter and another was the etiquette to not look at anybody's personal thing. But at the end, uh, in this dilemma, uh, the narrator's curiosity won and he opened that letter. It was a letter which was uh, written by Jim McPherson to his wife, Connie McPherson. And it had an envelope. The envelope had an address of Connie McPherson on it. And he started to read the letter. Part two. Dearest Connie, I write to you in a much happier frame of mind because something wonderful has just happened that I must tell you about at once you we were all standing in our trenches underline the word trenches yesterday morning christmas morning it was crisp and quiet all about as beautiful a morning as i have ever seen as cold and frosty as a christmas morning should be i should like to be able to tell you that we began it but the truth i'm ashamed to say is that Fritz began it. Underline the word Fritz. First, somehow, someone saw a white flag waving from the trenches opposite. Then, they were calling on to us from across no man's land. Underline no man's land. Happy Christmas, Tommy. Happy Christmas. When we had got over the surprise, some of us shouted back, same to you, Fritz. Same to you. I thought that it would be that. We all did. But then suddenly, one of them was up there in his grey great coat, waving a white flag. Don't shoot, lads, someone shouted. And no one did. Then there was another Fritz up on the parapet and another. Keep your heads down, I told the men. It's a trick. But it wasn't. One of the Germans were waving a bottle above his head. It is Christmas Day, Tommy. We have schnapps. Underline the word schnapps. We have sausage. We meet you. Yes. 
By the time there were dozens of them walking towards us across no man's land and not a rifle between them. Little Private Morris, underline the word Little Private Morris, was the first up. Come on boys, what are we waiting for? And then there was no stopping them. I was the officer. I should have stopped them there and then, I suppose. But the truth is that it never occurred to me I should. All along their line and ours, I could see men walking slowly towards one another. Grey coats, khaki coats, meeting in the middle. And I was one of them. I was part of this. In the middle of the war, we were making peace. Okay, students. The second part of the chapter now starts with the actual letter. Jim writes to Kony, dearest Kony, Something wonderful has really happened today. Now Jim is at the war front and he is uh, one of the soldiers of British Army who are there to fight against German Army. Now in this particular paragraph there are two special words written here, Fritz and Tommy. They are nobody, nobody's names. Fritz is, called, uh, is a nickname given to a German soldier whereas Tommy is a nickname given to British soldier. Now since they did not know each other's names, they, they uh, addressed each other with these nicknames. Now when on that particular morning, uh, next day was Christmas and on that particular morning, that beautiful morning when Jim had written this letter, he explains in his letter that both the soldiers were set in their trenches. Trenches is a place uh, on the ground where they dig it out and they make space for, so that they can stand and aim at the enemy. So all the soldiers, both the parties were in their trenches and they all were in good mood. Suddenly the British army, the Jim's uh, army saw that one of the soldiers of the uh, German army is has stood up and he is waving a white flag. Now, uh, students, do you understand what is the meaning of waving a white flag? It means that they want to have peace. It means that there will be no war. For some time, they want to have peace talks. So one of the German soldiers, when they uh, waved the white flag, the British uh, army, the British soldiers thought that it's kind of a trick. So they all, they thought that they will uh, take a aim and shoot them as soon as they approach them. But nothing like this happened. One by one, one by one, all the German soldiers came out of their trenches and they started walking towards the British army. At first, the soldiers of the British army thought that they are playing a trick and they're going to attack us, but they did not. They were come uh, all throughout the time. They were only waving white flag. Now, after this incident, uh, the British soldiers also kept their guns down and they also rose from their trenches and they went to an area to meet them. You could uh, find, as we were reading in the book, uh, in this paragraph also, that there was one particular line, no man's land. No man's land is an area where, which does not fall in any of the two countries and it's it's an area between the borders of the two country uh, two countries which is neither the uh, area of one country nor it is of the another country so that area is called as no man's land both the armies came into that no man's land and they started to interact with each other they talked about schnapps schnapps is a drink they talked about sausages. Sausages is a, um, is a snack which is made up of uh, chicken. And they also started talk them. Then there was, they both were so friendly with each other that there was no stopping. They talked with each other. They danced. They sang songs with each other. And in the midst of this friendship, Jim McPherson had befriended a German soldier called Hans Wolf and they both started to talk with each other. Hans Wolf and Jim McPherson were uh, discussing uh, so much about
the food, the drink, the particular books that they both read, their common interests and they did not know when the time passed. They both also shared the marzipan which Kony had sent to Jim. Marzipan is a kind of cake uh, which is decorated with fruits and nuts and uh, this is this particular dish is specially made when it is Christmas. And at the end of this paragraph there's this line in the middle of the war we were making peace. What does this line indicate? That there was a time when they were set to fight with each other the time when two countries were on the war front and they, there was the war was about to happen and in the midst of that particular time that crucial time both the armies instead of fighting were making peace isn't that great children just imagine how the the world would be if all the countries instead of fighting with each other decide to make peace with each other well this is the end of my first part of the chapter and before I end let's quickly recap what we have read today. Uh, the story starts with narrator who goes to an antique shop to buy a roll top desk. The desk which he chose particularly has got scorch marks that is burn marks and it was completely damaged by fire and water as if fire and water had taken a toll on it. Still. The narrator chooses to buy that desk, he gets it into the garage and he tries to repair it. When he is repairing it, he sees a particular drawer, a secret drawer in that desk. He opens that drawer with, his, all, with all his strength and he finds a small tin box wherein there is, a, uh, there is a slip of paper stuck on it with a cello tape and it says it is Jim's last letter to be buried with me when I die. He opened the letter, although he did not want to, but his curiosity took over him. He opened the letter and he saw that it was a letter from a person called Jim Macpherson, who had written this letter to his wife, Coney. And the letter uh, explains how Jim Macpherson, who was uh, fighting uh, against the German army, he was, in, he was a British soldier. And at the war front, on the Christmas Eve, how things had taken turn instead of instead of fighting a war what had actually happened he has explained in that letter more in my second part of the video thank you children students i have written down uh, the meanings of the words which i had made you underline you may note them down in your notebook and try to learn these words some of these words are already in the glossary and some are extra. Please note this down and learn them properly and you can use them in your own sentences also.